Well, hello folks, and welcome to episode 139 of Retro Power and Cut. And we're here nestling by the uh, second Mark One Escort project, Project Kuma, uh, nestling in the darkened corner of the uh, fabrication shop because it's the final bit where we've got to add a bit more lighting and we can't because there's a car in the way, which hopefully will be moving fairly soon. And to that end, Tom is busy working on this front wing that he has this week finished grafting the uh, arch extension into, and he's now metal finishing the, the front half of the wing on the car. He's been working on the bench doing quite a bit, but he's now finishing the work on the car. And he's just finishing up, we were just talking about it just prior to uh, turning camera on. Uh, he's been, he's blued up all this front, the front half of the wing. Uh, you can just see a few traces up here used. You got the blue. Yeah, yeah. The, uh, he's uh, blued that up with the uh, Dykem blue uh, layout fluid. It's a really thin ink, basically. Uh, you'll probably be familiar with it anyway, but it's basically a really thin blue ink. Put that on the panel. When you think you're getting somewhere near, when it all feels pretty good by hand and that the, the quality of the, the surface all feels pretty good, you, you get some of this out and depress yourself, basically. You put that all over it, go over it with the body file, and that will show you again all the high spots and low spots. And what looked pretty good when you just filed the steel, suddenly looks pretty bad when you put the blue on it because it's it's such a thin coating that it, it, it's very revealing. It shows any uh, any high and low spots at all. So he's now blued the front half and then been uh, pan panel beating, tapping up with the slapper and dolly. The, the key tools being a slapper and dolly to bring up the low spots uh, and take down any high spots and then the body file to, to, then, to then sweep over that, pull off any of the blue again, take the high spots just skim over all the high spots and expose them and then go back down, back over, take those down, take the low spots back up again and then again repeat and repeat and repeat and repeat and repeat and after a lot of hours you end up with something uh, like the front of that wing is now where basically there are no, other than tiny pits around the welds, there are no high and low spots and it's all looking really good so yeah, it's getting very very close to all correct this wing now. The next step will be we're Thursday now so next week we'll be on to starting on the, the wing the far side and that's the final corner of this car getting the uh, the arch extension graph well the original big big wing take cut out and then the new the new smaller arch extension grafted in that side and then probably roll, you know, rolling into the following week getting that one metal finished we'll be getting pretty then pretty close to the outside metal work being somewhere near and then the next phase after that will be obviously this car coming off the lift and onto the rotisserie to do any underside finishing. So that's where we're at on that. I'll leave Tom to his file and we'll, uh, we'll move on to... Oh! <laughs> There's always something waiting around the corner to trip Jamie up. So uh, we'll come over here at this point. I'll just move these bits off here. Steve's, uh, Steve's just started work in the background on this, doing a bit of paint strip, cleaning up the uh, roof. But uh, as you can see, Stu is working on uh, Project Churchill, which is on its wheels uh, for the first time since first time since the car since we started the project, isn't it? It's been off the jig. Yeah, first time in quite a long time. I don't even know how long. How many? Nearly 18 months. Nearly 18 months. There you go. First time in nearly 18 months that this car has not been attached to that select jig next to me. Um, so, yeah, the car was taken off on Tuesday this week and it's now on the floor, on its wheels, rolling on its the mocked up front suspension, as you'll remember from before. It's got the cut uh, upper front wishbones, which George has just this morning finished off the final bits of CAD work for to get those machined. We were just working on. Um, doing the tolerances for the press fit bushes in the upper arms. It's a bit difficult because we've got a selection of bushes and measuring them all, they're all slightly vary, they all vary in diameter a little bit. So working out, making sure that the smallest bush is still a press fit in the arm while not making the biggest bush too tight a press fit. So there's been a bit of, uh, there's been a bit of fiddling around going on there, but George has got all that finally uh, sorted out and buttoned up. And George is now getting on doing some work on the inside. They're about to scan the dash. George and wherever he's gone, George and his sidekick um, are about to uh, scan the dash area in the car to start work on the design work for the door cards and the dash, uh, which is really the next uh, phase on that. 
In the meantime, Stu's getting on with all the myriad of jobs that he couldn't do while the car was on the jig. So he's been busy working, finishing all the, doing all the final finishing work on the bulkhead area. He's just put the blanking panel in for the old uh, air intake at the bottom of the screen because we blank that off, that's no longer the air intake from the previous cars. We, take, we intake the cold air from the front and it comes in via a, a pipe under the inner wing here and then through the, bulk, through the inner wing and then through a hole in the bulkhead down there. That, that, that's all fed in by the bulkhead. So that's a, a separate, you know, there's no longer an air intake at the bottom of the windscreen. So that's going to be lead loaded and, uh, and lead filled. So that's one of the, uh, the next phases of jobs on that. And then I think Stu's going to be on to, you're really on to metal finishing. A lot of, basically, a lot of what's going on on the Escort on this then. A lot of metal finishing work, metal finishing the doors, metal finishing the quarter panels, doing some metal finishing on the roof. As I say, Steve's just been uh, DA sanding the roof because there's various bits of filler in it. Uh, and he's also been stripping the bonnet, getting that back to bare metal as well, so we can do any final finishing work on that. But yeah, nice to see it. I mean, the engine bay is looking brilliant now. Now Stu's pulled the engine out. He could get in and do the metal finishing work, you know, not metal finishing, but just all the finished welding uh, in the engine bay and getting all that tidied up, tidy, all, the, all the welds finished, all the bits of box section capped off, and everything just tidy in the engine bay. And it's, it's, looking, it's looking absolutely stunning now. It's getting very, very close. Um, yeah, that's pretty much where we're at on that. I think, have I, have I missed anything very obvious? I don't think so. It's just, it's just great to see it on the floor. I mean, get, get, get rewinding slightly again on that. The, the, we, we talked earlier on, I think I commented on a video going back some months about how low the car was going to look uh, when it was off the jig. And you now get the idea of that, how low the roof line is. If I walk around here, you know, this is just <laughs> an extremely low roof line now. It's, 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 quite a, it's quite an impressive, it's just, just a superb looking thing. We're all really, uh, really very pre pleased with how it's all worked out and I'm hopeful that most, most viewers will agree. I think, think we probably will. Um, that it, it's quite a stunning looking car. We're, uh, we're certainly very proud of it. So I think that's where we're at on that and we'll move along. Uh, we're gonna, I'm gonna briefly touch on the body shop. You guys in there have been buttoning up a few loose ends. Uh, we're at that sort of in-between projects phase again now. So they've been buttoning up various loose ends, painting a bit of a backlog of odds and ends for assembly shop. Uh, and also then flatting and polishing the first Mark 1 Escort, which I believe is now done. Is that, is that right, Steve? The, uh, is the Project 1 all that's flatted and polished now? That's all done, yeah, yeah, I just wanted to confirm, but yeah, so the Project One Escort is now complete, flattened and polished, all done, paintwork complete, uh, and that'll be rolling on very quickly in assembly shop now with, with the uh, assembly work, so there's a lot of work going on in the background um, that I'll, you know, Cal may or may not mention this week, but there's lots going on in the background in terms of getting uh, the parts required for that all lined up and sorted out, fasteners, coating processes, all that side of things all getting done in there, ready for that. And also in the background now, literally you can probably just hear it on the, uh, on the sound, Sam's doing the, um, some aluminium TIG welding on the uh, final aluminium tank parts needed for that Escort. Scott had already made the ones for this car, but the um, footrest uh, screen wash tank that we've mentioned before, there's a navigator's footrest um, in the footwell on both the Escorts, so, uh, very similar to almost the same as what we did on um, Gordon Murray's car. Uh, that screen wash tank also, is, so that footrest also doubles as a screen wash tank, but it's filled via a remote pipe via a header tank that's in the engine bay that sits symmetrically with the clutch and brake uh, fluid reservoir tank on the opposite side of the bulkhead. It'll all become clear when it's done, but the, the, the final bits of aluminium fabrication are being done on that. We were short of a couple of bits of aluminium tube and Scott had to move on to other things as well. So at the time they, there was some finishing work needed there and that's uh, what Sam's, but you can hear the, uh, the AC TIG firing away in the background. That's what Sam's on with there. And then finally, um, last and definitely not least, we come over to the um, uh, Project Lucky Strike uh, Allegro Stroke Integra. Uh, and 
uh, Bobby and Scott are both working on this at the moment, kind of in parallel on di different areas of the car. Scott uh, had been working on the A-pillar areas last week. He's got those finished off. Uh, Bobby's ha uh, come on to uh, do some work with him. He's uh, blanked off the area of the bulkhead. I, think, I don't know if that was covered last week. He's blanked off the original air intake in the bulkhead I mentioned about uh, being done previously, but that's now been done. And Scott's moved on to now completing the structure for the scuttle area on this. I'll put my drink down. Um, surgically remove my coffee cup from my hand for a minute. I carry it everywhere, otherwise I'll lose it all the time. Um, he's extending the, he's put, built an extension onto the rear, the dash, the dash facing part of the original Integra bulkhead. Uh, he's spot welded a, an extension onto that to move the line of that back a little bit. Uh, in this area here. This is an extension that's uh, moving that line back uh, and then he's making a, a filler panel that's going to spot weld to this lip at the bottom of the windscreen and that will come down and will sp we'll spot weld along here as well. That's going to be attached to the Allegro half, i.e. this half. This is Honda half, this is Allegro half. He's going to attach that to this half, Allegro half, spot weld to that. Uh, uh, but, but not spot weld to this yet, so we can actually spot weld it, we'll screw it for now, then we'll spot weld it to this half when the Allegro shell's lifted off, then we can drop it back down and spot weld it to that so that both sides are accessible. Similarly, this front part of the bulkhead, he's making a closing panel for this, he's gonna reshape the seam along uh, where that transitions into the engine bay, re-angle that slightly, and then fabricate a, pa a closing panel that spot welds across there between the uh, Honda and Allegro halves there, and that'll have access windows in to make uh, installing the wiper mechanism a little bit easier. In the meantime, Bobby is getting on with making the inner sill reinforcer sections, which I think one of is leaning up just over there right next to Jamie. Um, the, so Bobby's fabricated that sill box. He's already done this side and fitted it. It's screwed in place this side. They're gonna be temporarily screwed in place. They'll be fully spot welded once the Allegro body shell is lifted off again. I think we're gonna need a couple more on and offs of the Allegro half of the vehicle um, prior to everything then being finally spot welded at the moment. We're screwing things in place wherever we know we need to pull them apart again um, so that we keep access for as long as possible. It's very easy to get too far ahead of yourself at this stage, start welding things in place and then find you haven't got access to spot weld something. And I kind of like to spot weld things wherever possible. It just follows the production sort of process of a car more normally doesn't focus stresses in too many places, just generally a nicer way to do it. So what we're trying to do is make it all in the right order so that we can access everything with a spot welder in, in, the, in the right order of events and then assemble everything correctly so that we don't, we don't box ourselves in anywhere. Uh, I'm not explaining that very well, but you'll, you'll get the gist of what I mean. Um, so fairly imminently, we're gonna lift the body shell off again. We'll spot weld those sill boxes into place. These screws here will, uh, will be taken out. These ones will be replaced with spot welds to spot weld this upper sill section on. Then the sill boxes can be spot welded on. The, the extensions at the back, which Bobby's just making, these sections which he's making, which actually extend the rear sill upwards and tie it into the um, original Honda inner sill down here. This is all spot welds in. There's a piece welded in around here. That'll, that extends that back as far as the rear inner arch. That'll all be spot welded in place. So that's all the inner sill and then the sill inner reinforcer box all in place. So then it'll just be the outer sill. We're going to replace the outer sill entirely. What the, this sill step, the door step section, uh, will be taken off and we will remake that with a complete new outer sill which clears the new inner reinforcer box section. And then that will all be, again, temporarily screwed into place We'll lower the Allegro body, outer body shell upper part back over it, and then that will all be welded in place. And then that will leave us with the rear sill outer section, which we're going to remove from the bottom of the quarter panel. And we will refinish the bottom lip on the quarter panel where it's originally spot welded on top of the sill, such that that is no longer linked. We'll put screws through that into the new, in, into the new outer sill section, but we'll leave that unwelded because as we've touched on before, the quarter panels on this car will be carbon fibre and a different shape 
and they will be that will be glued in place. So we'll put uh, re, um, we'll put these tightenable. I haven't got one in front of me. We've got these these Cleco uh, fasteners, one eighth inch sprung Cleco fasteners. We have screw type ones which actually tighten up with a spanner as well. Similar function to these, but they tighten up with a spanner. We'll actually panel pin or Cleco those in place with the screw type Clecos. Then when we actually glue the final carbon fiber quarter panels on, we can pull that seam up with those um, panel fasteners while the uh, while the epoxy adhesive goes off, and that will glue that panel in place down there. Most of the rest of the body lines will be original spot weld lines where we're gluing the quarter, so that's not a problem. It is an original spot weld line down there, but it's less obvious uh, exactly how that goes. Um, that will all then be covered by the final sill trims, which will also be a carbon fibre part that will be going on. But anyway, I'm waffling on on many tangents, but that's basically the way the structure's uh, coming together on this. So very soon we will have the complete sill structures. We've got a little bit of finishing off the bottom of the A-pillar to do here. Scott's got a little panel to make to go in there. Um, he's done all the outer A-panel sections. He's working on the scuttle sections. Really, that will then only leave us, in terms of key structure, with the very rear part of the car, where we have um, a plan for that, to how to finish the rear of the spare wheel well that's now been cut off on the Honda floor. Um, we're going to reshape the back of that, we're going to remake the rear of the spare wheel well and we're going to tie all that into the Allegro structure along the seam across the bottom of the boot lid aperture and then we're going to leave uh, an area open below that and basically make what was the back of the boot in the Allegro actually the val the f all, make all of that into a valance panel at the back so all of that's technically under the car rather than in the car once that's finished. So yeah, we, we, at that point, we will basically have all of the structure of the car tied together and no need for any further access to any of those points. That'll enable us to weld the two vehicles together and that will become one. And at that point, it can have suspension fitted and it can actually roll around the workshop on its wheels. Um, all the front end is still to do, but the vast bulk of that will actually be carbon fibre on the finished car. We're, we're gonna mock it up with the original steel panels, but nearly all of the front end will actually be carbon. Um, on, on the final car. So uh, that, at the point that we have the rear of the boot done, the vast bulk of the key steel work will actually be done. <laughs> it's, uh, it, and it's, uh, we're, just, we're all looking forward to seeing it just roll around the workshop on its, uh, on its little Honda wheels. So yeah, that's it. But it, that won't be too far in the future. Uh, and on that note, I think we've pretty much covered everything in here. So I will hand over to Cal. Yeah. You have a thick ear, boy. Sugar for Sam. I box your ears. How are you getting on with these gloves? Good. They haven't broke yet. So. Hey everyone. Uh, Ironclad Heatworks gloves are uh, very good for uh, welding, it seems. In fact, this is a good good way to start the video. Totally impromptu, but with the if anybody's got any uh, suggestions on really good lightweight but heat resistant gloves for fabrication that don't wear out instantly that would be lovely with scott we're, we're trialing these for scott and he seems to be getting on well it's, it makes it sound as if this is some kind of sponsored thing which it totally <laughs> isn't i just saw them here as he was making a brew and thought i'd pass comment so so far so good on the uh, on the ironclad heatworks gloves i'm gonna make this a uh i'm gonna walk in the shop no oh, i can't make it an egg. oh it's tr it's tripped out because the blooming bin's full i was gonna have an extra shot in there but uh, the grout bin, as it's called, I think, is full. All right, uh, let's go and see what's going on. So, actually, I'm going to briefly touch on this, which uh, we ought to feature a bit more prominently at some point. This is Nat's own project, one of a couple. I think he mentioned his Autograss car, which is an LS transverse LS3 powered mini pickup, which he's building for autograss racing. But this is another project which is out of sort of on the back burner for a while, uh, which is a Range Rover Classic, also going to have an LS3 in it. Um, so he's already completely restored the chassis, the body, and actually the guys were just chipping away at a couple of paint jobs out of spare minutes. So they've just stripped and wrapped these front panels, and I think they've been prepping and painting the bonnet and the front wings. So gradually chipping away. Um, all right, moving on, uh, Land Cruiser. Uh, this week we got the prop shafts fitted. Um, up until this point, it hasn't really been necessary to get them on, but we're getting extremely close now to actually uh, being able to move this around under its own power. Um, just kind of nipping off a few loose ends. Adam's now fitted the upper dash pad. He finished the interior light installation in that, got that fitted, fitted the plastic ducts, that the sort of demist air vent, vent ducts in there. Um, so I think that's actually 
buttoned up all of the dash completely. Uh, we're just waiting on a couple of bits. We realised we didn't have any, we hadn't Xylan plated any washers for the bolts on the fuel tank enclosure which goes under the seats. Um, I think originally we hadn't intended to use any and then we realised it was going to mark the paint. So we've got some washers off being Xylan at the minute for that. And then once that's done, we can get the front seats in, uh, which I think, I think pretty much finishes off the interior. Um, Adam's been finishing off the other door seal uh, and then we've, We've been reviewing the rear door seals. We were never happy. We got, we got a complete seal kit for this from somewhere in the States, I forget the name. Um, and they're kind of reproduction molded seals and the quality is not great. And particularly the rear door seals. Uh, and I don't like the way that you can kind of see a wavy edge of the seal with the back door shut from the outside. So we've been trialing uh, just a generic kind of capital D profile seal around the, one of those rear doors just to see if that would work. And it, it's very promising. It's just, I think it's just not quite thick enough. Um, so we might have to look at another profile, but I'm, I'm certainly hoping to change the rear door seals for being a generic profile so we can actually get them to look a bit more attractive from the outside. Because although the, re, the repro kit no doubt keeps the water out, it just looks ugly from the outside of the car. Um, so that's another thing we're on with on this. Uh, I think that there was anything else. I think that's about it. I think it's basically get the Xylan parts back, get the seats in, the brackets for the throttle and transmission cable are also away being Xylan. Uh, so we can get those in when they're back. And then we've been chasing a little bit of a squeak on the engine, which has been driving us mad, to be honest. Um, just a, a sort of infrequent, high-pitched, squeak uh, which sound, kind of you would say it was some sort of belt train related squeak but it doesn't exist when the auxiliary belt's off because we're running it with that off at the minute uh, we've wondered whether it might be uh, a problem with a camshaft journal and oil feeds are there but that all looks good oil feed looks good um, cams all look great no marks on any of those we wondered if it was a actually an air leak on the inlet manifold so we've changed the in inlet manifold gaskets checked all of the ceiling of the faces on that that all looks good um so we're kind of just going through the motions of trying to track it down it's a sort of thing where i'm sure it would work perfectly well but it's a slight concern that we want to just iron out so we're going to probably next have a look at the tensioner or idlers on the cam belt train now i've been listening all around it with like a stethoscope probe and it's it's just so hard to pinpoint it kind of sounds like it moves around a little bit and you can kind of it sounds most loud loudest around the sort of cam pulley on the near side of the engine uh, and there's like an aluminium casting there which used to house the distributor and it has the cam sensor in it but that's probably with the probe where it sounds loudest um, but then it's quite a sounding box the shape of that so I don't know if it's transmitting up the cam belt or you know it's a, it's a very difficult one we're kind of in the process of fault finding that at the minute but uh, it'd be nice to get that ticked off and then with the other jobs out of the way we're straight into road testing now so looking good uh, let's have a look over here so Stratos um, that I think we, did we show that having PPF last week uh, certainly the, it's been it's been PPF now so we're gearing up for road testing but before we do that we wanted to just work through some of the uh, cold start and, and idle control mapping um, just to get the idle control a little bit better it's fly by wire so it, the idle control is just the throttle motor we're just ironing that, that out it was getting a bit of a surge on the idle and it's always a bit of a battle with the supercharger as well we've got a supercharger bypass so that tends to battle it because when you have a lower vacuum the bypass starts to open on the supercharger so ironing out the idle control um, and obviously cold start is very is a long drawn out process because you can only really do it once see how it goes then wait quite a long time for the engine to cool again and do it again so we're working through that and then i think probably early next week we'll get out on the road in this um, and yeah start trying to work through the uh, last refinements on the road uh, a few other details as well the guys have nibbed off and polished this front panel and finally fitted that they made some little nylon spacers to space it centrally in its gap mounted that uh, Adam's just making up some retainers to fit the badges in the wings, so they'll be fitted shortly. Uh, we've got the rear badges to go on. I've been vinyl wrapping the A posts, so we're going to make those black so that the sort of windscreen and side windows all appear as one kind of dark band. So I've done one yesterday, I've just got to do the other one. Um, so yeah, we're in little, little final details, badges, vinyl, vinyl sort of pillars, um, and then yeah, out on the road mapping. So see how that goes next week. Um, if we go over here actually Jamie if you go ahead of me over there um, Mustang 
was over with Dale for, although he's, he did a full kind of ceramic coating session on it a while ago. It's got a bit dusty from just being around the workshop and worked on, so we went back over there just for a quick refresh pre-delivery, as the plan with this is to deliver it back to its rightful owner next week. Um, we'll just do one final modification on the um, distributor. We've noticed on our various test drives that it was hesitating a bit under sort of light load, light throttle situations which I suspected was the vacuum advance pulling too much advance on when the throttle's almost shut, um, because of, uh, which would be clashing with the, the bigger overlap on the cams. Um, so to prove that theory, we ran it without the vacuum advance on, and that did completely solve the problem. Um, but we do want some degree of vacuum advance on there, uh, so we're just making a little limiting stop in the uh, distributor to allow vacuum advance, but limit how much advance it can pull on. So, you know, previously I think it was probably pulling on around 20 degrees of additional advance. Uh, and we're going to knock that that well back. To be honest, it's not. It's nice. It's nice to have it. You know, when you're just cruising along uh, and idling, but it's. Uh, it's it's kind of too much i think with the with this engine having some you know the cam profiles we've got in this engine so just finishing that off and then yeah ready ready to go on that uh morris so, so some well I, I will say it's a positive obviously we have the gearbox out which is never a great thing after you've built a car um but i was kind of dreading i had this sinking feeling of you know we've been chasing this clutch slip issue are we going to pull the gearbox out, look at it, go, yes, everything looks fine, and then still be scratching our heads over what it was. But that hasn't been the case. We've taken it all apart, and the clutch kit, uh, which was supplied as a kit, uh, does not appear to have enough clamping force. So we've only got the, the, I mean, just laying it here on the bench, the friction plates, I think it was about 0.5 or 0.6 of a mil, proud of the actual mounting face of the pressure plate which uh, is, is well under what it needs to be. I, my suspicion is that this pressure plate actually needs an eight mil thick friction disc, and this is more like seven or just over seven. Um, so we're gonna sort out a, a replacement friction plate for this, which will have the appropriate amount of clamping force. So slightly irritated. Uh, if those, if those long-term followers will remember, we had a very similar problem with um, Gordon's car where we were chasing a problem, which turned out to be a faulty clutch kit. Um, anyway. I'm kind of just glad that we have found something positive on that. Uh, and then James, in the meantime, has been working on the handbrake lever. So he's machined up a nice grip for the handbrake lever. Uh, he's made a mounting for uh, a micro switch for the warning light on the handbrake. And he's just making a little um, sort of bezel plate or retainer plate, shall we say, that bolts down under the handbrake and will in turn mount a bezel which finishes off the gator on the handbrake. Uh, I think he's also done the um, gear gator, attached that to the bezel, which we already had. Um, so la last details really on that, which we're just ticking through whilst we kind of get through this mechanical job. Hopefully we'll resolve this, get the gearbox in, and then I'll be back out on the road for the next, uh, next series of tests on this. Um, yeah, so all, all looking reasonably positive, you know, annoying that there's a problem, frustrating uh, as, you know, it's not really our doing. Um, but glad that we've got a, a positive result on what's causing it. Uh, and so Camaro, and there's been a, a knock-on series of jobs on this. We wanted to do the grill. So we previously cut out the, the sort of mesh section, if you like. It slats on the original grill, which is plastic. And it has kind of a, I, think, I guess it's an, an indicator light that sits in board of the headlight. And we wanted to get rid of those and just have the headlights and a plain grill. Um, so we'd already cut out the surround. We were going to fit uh, a mesh in there, but then realised we needed to know exactly what height the grill surround sat at, because it can vary. Um, and that then had the knock-on effect of realising that the bonnet alignment had never been set. Um, the front wings were kind of loosely on and roughly aligned with the doors, but the front end panel alignment had never been finally fixed. Uh, so that's then meant that Anthony's had to go through and start doing all the final alignment. So scuttle panel, doors to wings, bonnet to wings, and then with the, the end result of getting the, the front sort of slam panel in there, or nose panel, um, so we can then <laughs> work out the height that the grill needs to be to get the mesh into the grill. So all jobs that needed doing, but, but a kind of a domino effect of things which we hadn't uh, thought of until the last minute. Um, but yes, by the looks of that, that's uh, getting pretty close. Um, and then, yeah, we'll have that grill that will allow us to get all the front end together. And uh, yeah, it'll, it's all going to take shape in the front there. So it's uh, been a long time coming, but it's from the initial renders we did so long ago of how that engine bay was going to look, it's just great to see it all kind of coming together 
finally. So that is really good. Uh, let's have a little wander over. I wonder if there's anything else that I've missed in here. Uh, I don't think there is, but what I'm going to do is answer a few questions. So, if I have a quick look at my phone, I'm screenshotted a couple earlier. Uh, so, uh, first one was uh, the username Uncensored. What material do you use to create the jig for those inner arch tubs? I think this is referring to the Escort. Now, the, the jig was actually created to create the outer arches. We were also using it to create the first part of the shape for the inners because obviously that matches the, the lip on the outers. Um, but it's epoxy tooling block. Uh, you can get it from places like, I think East Coast Fiberglass do it. And they actually do a, a range of kind of modeling uh, materials right from kind of foams that you can hand sculpt to just model shapes by hand through kind of mid-density stuff which is still hand shapeable but could potentially be used to make a final part for something that might be upholstered right through to the, the epoxy the green epoxy block which is the stiffest material uh, which is intended to be cnc machined but then it can be used to hammer over it stiff enough that you can actually hammer form metal over it without generally without damaging it for quite a long while um, so you know looking back for people who haven't followed us for a long while the, the arches on those escorts were the shape of them was actually modeled in cad so we scanned the, the complete body modeled the arches in cad and then used the cad not only as a visual render to see how it was going to look and agree the design but also then to cnc machine those epoxy hammer form blocks um, so yeah it's a epoxy tooling block um, uh, next one uh, chris bainbridge one of the best parts of an xj to see coupe is the pillarless window profile do you think it would be possible to make a pillarless mark ii coupe um, yeah i mean ultimately it's possible to make anything. Um, that was never the, the intention with the one that we're doing, although it would look very cool. I mean, obviously there are um, complications of doing that. The ceiling systems part of it is one of those things. So as soon as you go for a pillarless coupe, you've then got a complication with how the door seal works because the window on the door needs to close against something. Uh, and on, usually on pillarless coupes, there's some kind of edge trim on the rear window, which has part of a seal on it. So there would be more engineering involved because the ceiling systems would need to be designed from scratch. Um, and there is an implication obviously on the structure. So you know, removing the B pillar obviously removes some of the structure. So you'd have to engineer enough structure into the roof that you were happy with the strength of it. Now, <laughs> the point at which you draw that line is obviously entirely up to you. Um, but yeah, it would certainly be possible to do. And I do wonder, you know, in my head, I think, mm, I wonder what a, a pillarless raked roof Mark II Jag Coupe would look like. I think probably pretty cool. Um, and Adam Lippitt, question, do you ever turn down projects if you feel they don't fit with the ethos of retro power or are too modern? Well, yeah, 100%, 100% all, all the time. Um, any project we take on has to, fit with what we do and in fact there's there's a, a number of critical things really certainly we are not taking on projects just to take on the work for the sake of making money uh, that's kind of the last driving factor um, it's got to be a project that we're interested and excited about you know everybody's got to be sort of excited about what we're creating um, the customer's got to be the right person these projects are a, a, a good long relationship generally so you know, we want to be embarking on that relationship with somebody we kind of gel well with. So, you know, making sure the person is the right person. And obviously the budget's got to be there. So it kind of comes down to those three factors. Something that we share uh, excitement about the end result of. Um, something where we get on well with the customer. And something where the budget is in place to allow us to build it to the level we'd like to build it to. And that, that last factor is kind of the one that we've, we've kind of built up over the years. You know, initially it's very difficult to get somebody to entrust you with a lot of money for a project when they don't really know, you haven't really got a track record. So we're now getting to that point where we are finding the people who kind of share the vision, we get on well with them, and they've also got the budget there to allow us to, you know, 
build the car to our dream level. And that, that's always been the factor is you're kind of reining things in because you know the customer can't afford it. And that's, that creates the frustration. And when you get to the stage where you'll get a customer who says, you know, yeah, just go, go wild with it. And you know, I, I trust you to do, it, to do it right and to the right level. And that's where it, then it kind of the enjoyment level goes up because you're you're being allowed we always want everything to be like to the nth degree you know and it's it's just finding people who are happy for you to go to that nth degree and have got the budget to afford it um so yes in answer to the question yes we turn down i would say probably i guess we get on average and probably an inquiry every other day um and i would and we choose to take on the number of cars we're building so i would say at the moment it's sitting at around four to five a year um, so that gives you some idea of the percentage of the inquiries we get that we actually agree to take on um, so yeah that's uh, that's the end of the end of that one uh, post up your questions this week uh, we'll go through next week or i'll try and remember to go through next week uh, and the sort of interesting questions i, I will answer um, in the meantime go on the shop buy yourself a mug buy yourself a hoodie and we'll see you again next week that's a wrap that's a wrap